singing. Okay, I know that Ted's probably happy with this weather. I don't know about you, I don't like cold weather. And yet, here I am in Decatur, Illinois, <laughs> where we've got nothing but cold weather to look forward to now for the next several months. I, I looked ahead on the uh, forecast, weather forecast. Yeah, it's not going to be warm anytime soon. So, all right, this morning, we are going to talk about the Bible. And as I hold up this Bible, I'm reminded of what a precious gift God has given to us. It's a book, yes. In fact, it's a book that's made up of 66 books. And many in the world would say, it's just a book. It's written by man. But they're so wrong. This is a very special book. This is the very word of God. It's a precious gift that God has given to us. Uh, Second Timothy, if you'll bring up that slide. Oh, there you go. Second Timothy 3.16, you're familiar with, I'm sure. It says that all scripture, all of the Bible, is given by inspiration of God. Remember that, inspiration of God. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Let's pray. Father, how we thank you this morning for your great love we thank you for Jesus and what Jesus did for us to provide the way to heaven. And Father, we thank you this morning that we are blessed to have your precious word in our hands this morning. Help us not to take it for granted. Help us not to ignore it, but rejoice in it, to read it, to study it. And we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Father, that we can gather together and talk about this. So Father, thank you for all that you've blessed this church with and what you're blessing us with today. We'll thank you for it now. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, the word inspiration. Inspiration of God. It's given to us by inspiration of God. What does inspiration mean? It means God breathed. It was, yes, it was penned by man. But they simply wrote this verse makes it clear. They simply wrote what God put in their hearts to put down on parchment, on paper. Uh, 2 Peter 1, 21 tells us that. It says, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake or wrote the words down as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Yes, man penned this book. But the words came from God, and they are not the author. It says, who wrote this book? Who wrote this book? And it's interesting to see which individual penned that book, but God is the author. That's the one thing we've got to remember. God is the author of this book. Satan has attempted throughout, uh, from, from the Garden of Eden forward, he has done his best to destroy the word of God, to change its meaning, to, uh, uh, but he hasn't been very successful, has he? We've seen that the word of God has endured for all this, these uh, 2,000 years plus, and it has not just endured, it has grown. <laughs> we know that the Bible is a best-selling book worldwide. It's the best-selling book of all time. It is, uh, I looked at this up and it says it has been estimated that 5 billion Bibles have been sold uh, since they began mass producing them, mass printing them. Most households in this country have at least one. Um, our son Ethan, I think he's got 30 or 40. <laughs> Every, they all say the same thing, but they have different references and, and different study uh, methods. Uh, he's, he's got one Bible that's written in Spanish. Uh, he's he's uh, studying Greek right now, and he wants to, to buy a, a Greek, a Bible in Greek, 
and study it and read it and study it from the Greek itself. Good for him. I can't do that. <laughs> I'm not smart enough for all that. But we know that as many Bibles as, as, as are out there today, surveys indicate that the Bible is rarely read. It's, and that's even among churchgoers. And uh, how do these surveys, do you think these surveys are, are, are accurate? I don't know if a survey comes to a Christian, is he going to admit he doesn't read his Bible? So probably is uh, even less. Uh, the survey is, is pointing out that there are even fewer people that read their Bibles. But I submit that we should not just read it. We need to study it. And yes, grab that cup of coffee because that makes the study go better, I can tell you. I know Bob did, never grabs his cup of coffee and does that. <laughs> We've worked, he's made it clear he hates coffee. But I got to have my coffee. I already drank two cups of coffee just in Sunday school. Uh, but what we need to do is not simply read it like any other book. We need to get into it. We need to deeply get into it. We need to study this book. So with the next slide, what is the purpose of Bible study? Well, number one, God commands us to study it, not just read it. It says in 2 Timothy 2.15, as you can see on the screen, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. This is truth. This is the one truth in this world that we can stand upon. This is the ever, never, never changing word of God. And uh, it tells us in uh, uh, Joshua 1.8, this book of the law, this Bible, shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then shall thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. How do you define success, by the way? Well, the world would define it by your checkbook, the, the, your, your, your finances, uh, how well off you are, uh, by the house you live in, by the car that you drive. That's all material things. Success in a Christian is to love the Lord with your heart, with your whole heart, love your neighbor as yourself, and serve God. If you do those things, you are a success. All the material things are going to be left behind when, when the Lord comes or when you die before and you go to be with him. Success is, look at Paul. You could say, well, he certainly wasn't a success. Uh, look at all the beatings he took and, oh, he was a great success because he loved the Lord. He shared the, the words of God with others. He loved others. He sacrificed and served God. He was a great success. Well, what's the second reason to study? Is to, and that's on the next slide, is to grow in grace and knowledge of God. 2 Peter 3.18 says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, since the Bible is God's word, studying it is our way to learn more about him, to learn more about what he, who he is, to learn more about how his love shows, how he demonstrates his love to us. It helps us to have that relationship with him because he's no longer our, just our creator. God, when we trust Christ as our savior, when we're born again into the family of God, he becomes our father. And the world says, well, we're all God's children. No, we're not. That's a nice thought. We're all God's creation, but we're only God's ch children if we trust Christ as Savior and we're born again. And so through his words, we, better, we come to better understand who he is, his nature and his attributes. And we come to understand just how great a love 
that he has for us that honestly, his love is so great, we can't even wrap our mind around how great a love that he has for us. He sent his son. He sent Jesus to die in our place, take the punishment that we deserve. And he died on that cross. He was nailed to that cross and he died. But he was buried. But the great news is he rose again to give us victory. And so that's, that's how God manifested his love for us. God doesn't want to see, we know from the Bible, that God does not want to see a single person. Jesus died for all. He does not want to see a single person die and go to hell. Hell wasn't made for mankind. Hell was made for Satan and his demons. But sadly, so many people never trusted Christ as Savior, rejected God's wonderful gift of salvation, and they are going to spend eternity in hell. Number three, grow in our faith. You study the Bible, you'll grow in faith. You'll learn to trust him in all things, good and bad, that come into your life. And I can remember one time, and just like the, uh, the man in the Bible where it says, I believe, but Lord, increase my faith, help my faith, help, help me to grow and trust help me to grow in my faith in you and i was saying that prayer one day i said lord help me to grow in faith my faith isn't what it ought to be and then god reminded me in in romans 10 17 it says so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of god so what how did that speak to me that tells me I need to read this more. I need to study this more. The Bible says by doing that, by coming to church and hear people preach the word of God, it's coming to Sunday school and, and uh, studying the word of God in a group. That's faith by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you wanna grow in your faith? That's one place to begin, study your Bible. Timothy, well, know, was a man of great faith and a wonderful servant of God. And uh, where did that great faith come from? The scripture tells us in 2 Timothy 3.15, it says, And that from a child thou, Timothy, has known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Uh, where did his faith begin? It began by learning, studying the scriptures. He was taught from a child. That's why we put such an emphasis on uh, youth and programs and junior church and Sunday school and, and uh, WANAs. We want to reach these kids while they're young so they don't make the same stupid mistakes I've done in my life and they get saved young in life, just like Timothy just like Timothy. Number four, to have strength. Study the Bible, to have strength to stand in temptation. Look, some of the uh, TV evangelists like to tell us, oh, trust God and as your, as your, uh, trust Jesus as your savior and your problems are over. Especially if you send some money to blah, blah, blah. And is that true? Is that biblical? No, that is not biblical. There's, as a Christian, when we trust Christ, we know that if we're going to live for the Lord, we're going to have trials. That's what the Bible says. We're going to have problems. We're going to have troubles. But what does the Bible also teach us? That God is with us. That he will help us in those trials. He will take that trial away or he'll give us the strength to go through it. Uh, it says in Isaiah 41, 13, for I, the Lord thy God, and this is a promise of God, and you can remind him of that when you pray. Uh, for I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, fear not, I will help thee. How much more clear 
can it be? God is with you. God is with us. God wants to bless us. God wants to give us strength. But we will have problems and trials. But we can stand in those trials and problems because we know that God is watching over us, that God will take care of us. Number five, study the Bible to know his will and serve him. His word will help you to discover what your purpose in life is. He said, well, I'm not sure that, uh, I, I don't know what my, I, I, I've trusted Christ as my savior, but I really don't know what God wants me to do now. Get into the Bible and God will speak to you. God will speak through his word. He would show you. He, every child of God, God gives us a gift to use in his service. And that's exciting. And he will equip you to serve. You say, well, I don't know what my gift is. Well, there are... Uh, Pastor has some things that will help you find out what your spiritual gift is. But the best thing that you can do is get into the word of God. It tells us that in, in uh, Romans uh, uh, 12, 1 and 2. You want to know the will of God for your life and the purpose that you have? Because every you have breath this morning. You have a purpose. God is wanting to use you and bless you. He will equip you and give you strength to do whatever he has you to do. I can remember when I got saved, and, and you've heard my testimony before. I was 33 years old when I got saved. And uh, so I wasn't sure what I was supposed to do yet. I, I had no clue. I really didn't even know what the Bible said about pretty much anything except salvation. I knew I was saved. And uh, so they came to me and said uh, in a neighborhood Bible time, which is like a BBS, and they they came to me and said, uh, we want you to, could you teach fifth graders? <laughs> no, I can't speak in front of anybody. <laughs> I can't do that. That's not something, that, that can't be what God would have me to do because why would he have me to do something that I really can't do? I was telling Ryan a little earlier that uh, I never raised my hand in class because if the teacher called upon me, I felt every eye upon me. And I'm such an introvert that, wow, I just, uh, I just choked up. I couldn't even respond. And, uh, but that's what God does. He takes the unequipped. He takes the, the, the ones who can't seemingly do something, and he calls you to do that. And he equips you. And I can't even imagine from that day that I got saved that I'd be standing up before you today. But that's the grace of God. It's not anything that I did or anything that I could do. It's called the grace of God. God called me to do, to teach. And I have been doing that for a lot of years now. And I'm so grateful. And there's no greater joy, by the way, than using your gift to serve. There is great joy in that, I can tell you. And I'm sure that, that some of you that are using your gift and, and, and that you are serving, because there's so many servants in here as I, as I look around, so many people that are involved and, and serving. And just thank you for that. So, number six, study the Bible to realize that he will guide us in our daily walk. We need to, to study the Bible to use that Bible to help us in our walk with our daily walk with God. Psalms 32, 8 says, I will instruct thee. You want to know how to live, what to do? He says he's, he's going to instruct us. Psalms 32, 8 says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way, in the way which thou shalt go. He says, how does that, all that happen? Well, study the Bible. Pray, study the Bible, and God will speak to you, and God will instruct you. It'll happen. Psalms 119, 105, as uh, I think many of you know, thy word, his word, is a lamp unto my feet and a light 
unto my path. You want to know how to live in this world? How to walk daily with the Lord? How to love and worship him? How to live for him? Get into the Bible. And the last is number seven is learn the truth so as not to be deceived. This is, as I said earlier, this is the truth. This is God's word. This is the foundation that we can stand upon. We need to learn what it says in here so that we're not easily deceived by false teaching, false teachers. It says in Ephesians 4, 14, study this, that we be henceforth, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. I know that uh, I've had personal experience with that. Maybe you have too. People come into your door, false teaching. And uh, I had it happen to me at work and before I got saved. I had somebody come to me. He was a Jehovah's Witness. And uh, he said, can I share something from the Bible? I didn't know who a Jehovah's Witness was. I had no idea what they believed, what they taught. And he says, can I show you some things from the Bible? And I said, okay, sure. Because I always, even before I was saved, the one thing I learned growing up was this is God's word. That's the only thing I had no clue what it said, but I always believed that this was God's word. So he was going to open up God's word and he was going to show me some stuff. And he did. And he says, see, well, there's going to be 144,000 people saved and go to heaven. And uh, he says, it's important that you're going to be, that you be one of them. I'm saying, you mean out of all the millions, there's billions of people living that only 144,000 people are going to heaven? That was a little disturbing. <laughs> what it was is not just disturbing, it was false teaching, as we know. And uh, so he's referring, he took something completely out of context, and that's what false teachers do. They take things out of context, and they'll deceive you if you don't know any better. Well, how can you avoid uh, false teaching? Get into the Word, find out what it exactly what it says. You know, the world's academia, the scientists, and we were talking uh, this morning in Sunday school, uh, there's a new theory out now that the, earth, that the scientists say that the earth is uh, hollow. Well, I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. I don't know. But the scientific community many years ago said the earth was flat, too. So you can't always believe what you hear from the scientists, right? But uh, the scientists, the philosophers, the astronomers, and so forth, they spend their lifetime and millions of dollars attempting to answer the basic questions of mankind. They spend a lifetime in research. Where do we come from? Oh, that's the big one, right? Where does life come from? Where does, man, where does mankind come from? How did we get here? What is our purpose in life? What is our destiny? What happens after we die? Which came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> well, the Bible tells us, by the way, spoiler alert, the chicken. It was the chicken. And we, we see that in Genesis, don't we? But all these questions aren't found in deep space or the depths of the ocean. The answers are found in God's holy word. Every one of those questions I just read off, those, there are answers to those. And they're in the Bible. A man named William Lyon Phelps, uh, he was a professor at Yale University in the 1940s. He said this, I thoroughly believe in a university education for both men and women. But he didn't stop there. But he said, but I believe a knowledge of the Bible without a college course is much more valuable than a college course without the Bible. Things have changed a whole lot at Yale. <laughs> you won't find a professor there probably saying that to this day. But how right this man was. Yeah, it's great to learn math and history. And, but this is the most important education that we can get, is God's holy word. 
Many of our leaders understood this. George Washington said this. You're probably not going to find this stuff in the history books. I didn't. George Washington said this. It is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. President Woodrow Wilson said this in a speech. I have a very simple thing to ask of you. He is as he has he given a speech to the nation. I have a very simple thing to ask of you. I ask every man and woman from that from this day on they will realize that part of the destiny of America lies in their daily study of this great book. Wow. He understood, didn't he? The great general Douglas MacArthur said this, Believe me, sir, never a night goes by, be I ever so tired, I read the word of God before I go to bed. Putting this together, this message together this morning has just convicted me of all over again how mechanical I become as a Christian oft times. I read the Bible because it's time to read the Bible. An hour later, I may not even remember what I read or studied because I, I embrace the rules rather than my relationship with God, understanding that I'm not just reading any book here. I looked at how I spend time in reading and study, and some things I do are good. Sometimes the, some of the things I do, I get into a rut and I don't do so well. I could certainly make some changes in my Bible study that will help me get more out of it. I found out one thing as, as a Sunday school teacher, and I, every Sunday school teacher will know this. You get so much out of studying the word yourself that you want to communicate that. And I get so much. We're studying Revelations, and we're nearing the end of it. You know, we're in chapter 19. I have gotten so much out of that study that I never knew before. And that's what a study will do for you. It will give you so much knowledge, so much information. But what it, gets, what it does more than anything else, it helps you in your relationship with the Lord learn how much he loves us and what we can do for him. So let's have some practical uh, su suggestions that will help you study the Bible, that all of us can use in studying the Bible. Number one, always begin with prayer. Always begin with prayer. Let God know that you're not just reading it. You want to learn. You want to, you want to understand what uh, you're reading. So it says in Psalms 119, 18, open thy, my, thine, uh, my eyes. Open your eyes. He said, Lord, open up my eyes that I may behold the wondrous things out of thy law. John 16, 13 says, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, talking about when the Holy Spirit comes, is come, he will guide you unto all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he, he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. What that is basically saying is, the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. We need to ask the Lord to guide us as we study his word so that we understand. Open my eyes, God. Let me see today. Gain something that will help me be a better servant. Gain something that will help me understand you more. Help me today, God. Number two, there's no minimum or maximum time that you should spend in study. Uh, tradition, oh, you need to spend, I've, I've heard different churches say, you ought to spend at least a half hour every morning. Or you ought to spend at least an hour a day in study. They got, the Bible doesn't tell us that at all. What does it tell us? Well, what is important is how, not how much you read or how little you read. It's what you learn, what you've, what you've been taught. 
uh, that's important. So number three is decide the method. How you, how you want to study the Bible. You can do it so many different ways. First, just make a commitment to set aside a time each day to study. And, uh, and you can begin your study by starting in a book. You can take the book of John. Okay, I'm going to study the book of John. And uh, that's a great place to start. And then take all the time you need. I know there's, a, there's seemingly a, uh, the pressure in the Christian community is, I've read my Bible through this year. Well, that's great. Awesome. What did you get out of it? The, the most important thing is not that you've read it through in, in one year, but what did you gain? What did you learn that will help you to be a better Christian? So don't worry about how long. Just worry about how much you're learning. You can study by uh, studying a book or you can study words. You can simply, you can study about an individual, study the life of Paul, study the life of Christ, uh, study the life of Elijah, and what made them great Christians. Uh, you, could, you can do a study on just the individuals in the Bible. You can do a study of just researching words or researching doctrines. What does the Bible say about baptism? What does the Bible say about salvation? What does the Bible say about whatever doctrine that you're, you're concerned about. So you can study it by a doctrine. Or you're, like I said, you can study it by just researching words because certain words have special significance in the Bible, right? For instance, the word believe. The Bible says in John 3, 16, we must believe that Jesus died for our sins, that Jesus was buried and rose again the third day, that we can have eternal life so the word belief, belief becomes very important, doesn't it? So what does that word mean? Well, that word, you ought to study that word and see how it's used. And remember the story, I think it's in John 6, where the, uh, the uh, crowd was there, Jesus was speaking, and, and uh, there was a lawyer in that crowd. And he, he, uh, he questioned, well, what, what must, how can we please the Lord? What do we got to do? Basically saying, what can, what, what can we do? What must we do to, uh, to go to heaven? And Jesus' response, it wasn't based upon all the works, rules, keeping commandments. He said, believe. That's what God wants you to do. Believe. So study that. That word appears, by the way, in 125 times in the New Testament. So you can do a great word study there. Or fear not. I love fear not. I, I actually did a study on just that. Fear not. It is amazing what you find when you do that study and how often that God comes to man when we're in the middle of problems and trials. And he said, fear not. I'm with you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to bless you. So we can also study it by topic. Just pick out a topic and, and, and find uh, uh, all the uses of it in the Bible. You can e use uh, any of or all of these messages, uh, methods of study. You can change it up so that you don't get into a rut, but don't get into a hurry. The goal is to understand uh, what you've read, not how much. And to help you understand, maybe it'd be a good idea if you keep a notebook or a, a spiritual diary and ask yourself these questions or record these things and say, what is the main subject of, of this passage or what I'm uh, learning? What is the key verse? Uh, who are the persons that are revealed in this passage? What is being said to them and how does it apply to me? Is there sin for me to confess and forsake? Is there a command for me to obey? Is there any promise for me to claim? For example, in the book of Judges, we see Israel blessed when they obey God, right? Put him first. And when they turned away from God, God judged them. Well, it's easy to understand and apply that principle to our life. But keeping notes, will uh, you'll just be blessed later as you go back. It's like a, uh, a uh, prayer list. You go back and you look at the, what you've prayed for. And 
check it off. And there's time when you come, you, you, you uh, get to a place where you're discouraged. Go back to that prayer list and see all the answers to prayer that God, and it'll bless your heart and it'll encourage and comfort you. And number five is to literally, is to interpret the Bible literally. Accept the usual literal sense of the words unless uh, scripture is, is uh, making it clear that this is symbol to, symbolism or it's a parable. Uh, some would have us to believe that many of the miracles, even some Christians believe some, many of the miracles are just symbolic, like the six days of creation. The Bible said they, that the Lord created everything in six days. Uh, people can't see how that's possible. So they say, well, each year represents maybe a billion years. No, that's nonsense. Uh, the Bible was, the, the earth was created and the heavens and, the, uh, and mankind all in six days. Crossing the Red Sea. Uh, how many times have you heard, well, big deal. At that time of the year, there's only an inch or two of water. Well, that makes it a greater miracle because of all the Egyptians who were drowned in two inches of water, right? So, uh, no, crossing the Red Sea. The Red Sea was parted by Moses. And manna from heaven. God's, God sent manna from heaven. The bakery of heaven. He sent manna to mankind. That was a miracle that God did. Feeding the 5,000. Uh, all the streets of gold that we read about. Uh, we accept what God says there is literal and there's no reason for any other interpretation. And then interpret what the Bible says in context. Read what it says before and after that verse. Compare it with other scripture. Uh, you could say the Bible teaches atheism that there, because the Bible says that there is no God. But read it in context. What it says is, that a fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Uh, and if all you read was just this verse, let me give you an example. If all you read is this verse, you would uh, believe that we're not saved or we're, we're saved and justified and made righteous by our works. Listen to what it says in James 2, 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? When he offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar, what is James saying here? He, that, that Abraham was saved by works, by keeping the commandments, by keeping what God told him to do? Is that right? Well, let's, let's do a little research here. Romans 4.1, it says, What shall we say then, that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, meaning he can't boast of, of, of his works that got him to heaven, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? See, we're going back to what does the Bible say? How Abraham got saved. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth. Him that believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And in Galatians 2.16 it says this, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. Not, you can't do anything to get to heaven by, by some works that you... Uh, it's not through a membership of church. It's not through baptism. It is believing. It says, but, it's not justified by works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. How much more clear is that? There's nothing, no works that you can offer God except one thing, believe, put your faith and trust in Jesus. So what, is, what was James saying there in that first verse I read that says, 
Uh, was not Abraham our father justified by works? Is James' doctrine messed up? No, what James is saying is, if you're saved, we should see that you're saved by your works. You're not saved by your works, but you should work because you're saved. And uh, that's what he is saying. So if you're saved this morning, we should see that by your works. Are you serving God? And of course, we can't see, man can't see your heart. Only God knows what's in your heart. But it is said, and I'm about to close, believe it or not. It is said that there are three stages of Bible study. First, the cod liver oil stage. That's where you take it like medicine because you know it's good for you. The second stage is the shredded wheat biscuit stage. It's a little dry, but it's nourishing. And the third stage is the peaches and cream stage. It's sweet, and you just look forward to it. The Bible will change your destiny. It will change your desires. It will change your direction. It will change your life. I encourage you this morning, get into the Bible. Study it. Come to Sunday school. Come to church. Don't neglect this precious gift that God has given us. You bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. Let me ask you this. Maybe there's someone in here that, that I'm not sure I, I am a child of God. I'm not sure that I am saved. I am not sure that I'm going to heaven. Let me, let me ask you this morning, examine your heart. If that's you, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, please raise your hand. I'm not going to point you out or ask you to come forward. I just want to pray for you this morning. Is there one like that this morning? All right, let me ask you this. And I certainly don't want any hands raised. But how is your Bible study? Are you getting into the word of God? Are you studying it? Are you getting into a greater understanding of who our God is? I encourage you today that make your Bible study an important thing. And again, it's not how long you spend, it's how much you learn, how much you get from it. Lord, we thank you for all that you've blessed us with. We are truly blessed. And I ask you, Father, to help me uh, to improve my Bible study, help each of us to Realize what a precious gift that you've given to us, this Bible that we have before us today. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in this church. We thank you and praise you for the pastor that you've uh, given us and pray that you bring him back safely to us. And Lord, thank you for all that you have waiting for us on the other side. We are truly blessed and we're so grateful and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.